You're listening to We Deepen Media. Have you heard? The We Deepen Podcast Network has a new show. The Elevate to Legendary podcast by Dr. Nikki is a journey to activate your fullest self-expression. Dr. Nikki interviews leaders who have transcended perceived limitations in order to make a meaningful impact. Guests share their stories to teach you how to optimize your body, brain, and spiritual connection to manifest a truly fantastic life. Be sure to search for Elevate to Legendary with Dr. Nikki in your podcast app or go to wedeepen.com backslash podcasts to subscribe now and listen later. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Deepen with Christina. I'm your host, Christina Weber, founder of We Deepen and Feminine Weapon, and also a certified professional love coach for people who want to elevate their relationships and create transformational experiences. This podcast follows my entrepreneur journey and shines light on the human connection industry. In this episode, you meet Leonardo Cantano. Leo is an Argentinian musician, composer, music producer, and meditation guide. He began his musical career at the age of 18 after moving to New York City from Buenos Aires. He made five records over a seven-year period and did extensive touring as a singer and multi-instrumentalist. He was taught Vedic meditation by the renowned teacher Tom Knowles, and he has maintained his meditation practice since then. His lifelong passions are Eastern philosophy, the healing powers of psychedelic medicine ritual, community, music, and meditation. He launched Zendo Stereo in 2018. Leo has guided Zendo Stereo for over 4,000 people in person and via live streams with performances in public and private venues across the United States. In 2020, he was invited to MIT Santa Barbara to be a keynote speaker with the presentation titled Music Mindfulness and Altered States. Before we get into it, I want to share what's happening with We Deepen. First, we've added a few new festivals and events on the calendar at wedeepen.com backslash calendar. Bakde Love Fest is September 15th through 18th in Lake Isabella. It's just 2.5 hours outside of Los Angeles. It's three days of kirtans, yoga, chanting, and ecstatic dance produced by One Love Fest. Unleash is returning September 23rd to the 25th to a location in Austin, Texas. Unleash is a substance-free, three-day guided transformational dance journey designed as a catalyst to activate your fullest self-expression and creative power, releasing limiting blocks that prevent you from being your fullest, truest self. Tantra Speed Date is happening Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Diego, New York, Boston, London. Ugh, if you are not in a relationship and available, definitely check out a Tantra speed date. If you don't meet your person there, it'll activate you that when you go out into the world, you are more open-hearted and minded to be able to receive more deeper connections in everyday life. Use promo code WeDeepen to register for experiences at wedeepen.com backslash calendar. Let's get into today's episode. Enjoy. This podcast today, I'm going to try something a little different. There are three questions that when a guide or a brand submit their experience to be promoted through the We Deepen network that we always ask. And they are questions that are, I made them up. So they're questions that are important to me. And we're going to use these three questions plus a bonus question to frame our conversation today. These questions are, what's your zone of genius? How's your love life? And why do you do what you do? And that bonus question is, Leo and I are going to wrap about, because essentially this podcast is a little bit spontaneous that we're recording today because him and I had a meeting scheduled. And an hour before the meeting, I sent him a voice text and said, hey, do you want to turn our meeting into a podcast? So you are going to then end, um, or you can hear our conversation as we, we wrap the podcast where we talk, we deepen Zendo Stereo collaborations. 
So I'm super excited to welcome uh, or introduce you to Leo in this moment. Leo, welcome to Deepen with Christina. Well, hello, and thank you for having me. This is a very spontaneous honor and privilege. (laughs) (laughs) It it feels good. So let's start with that first question. Yeah. What's your zone of genius? Um, I will say my zone of genius is an overlap of music, mindfulness, and emotion, right? Or even music, psychedelics, and emotion. Those three things are the things that I feel like I've been working on most of my life. I love that. And I see how true that is for you, especially because I have experienced a Zendo stereo. You know, you and I met only months before the bomb, I'll say the bomb when, when COVID <laughs> blew up in, in 2022 and we were completely unexpected and, um, and we had begun working together. Zendo stereo was featured as a mystery experience. We deep in had um, in, in the beginning of 2020, we had the first Friday monthly was a mystery experience. Uh, people in Los Angeles showed up to an event that was free um, and they were surprised with one of the transformational workshops or experiences that we promote. So they had a, got a little sample of it. So Zendo Stereo, I remember I, um, so, and, and you can, I'll have you explain it a little bit more. I'll give you my perspective of Zendo Stereo is, you know, you show up to this um, a room and there are, I, you know, it's almost like you create beds, like individual beds that we well, wrap. I call them, I call them pods. Pods. So you're right. People show up to this individual little like mini spaceship and it's like an air mat, like a camping air, like a sleeping mat. That's like spirit. I mean, like, sorry, like uh, a galaxy theme with a little red pillow and a purple blanket. And it's a blindfold and a pair of headphones and a postcard and a pen waiting for you in your little pod, right? All you need to do is take your shoes off. The room is being decorated with like lights and it looks super soft and inviting and almost warm, right? Uh, Regardless of the size of the room, I bring like, you know, LED lights and I kind of dial them all in. So the idea is to create a certain setting that the moment you step into the room, you're transported into this almost like, you know, ceremony or ritual space, right? Which is important to sort of like, okay, we, we, we're drawing a line between our everyday go, 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 do, do, do. And now we're like, take your shoes off. Let's go into a little almost like slumber party, you know, pillow fort vibe slash like, psychedelic you know temple <laughs> right uh and it's usually like you know i'm in the front and the people are just laid out whether in a circle or straight but the idea is like i'm not even the center of the attention because you are going to lay down and put a, a eye mask on right so the experience is very internal but the container sets you so you can be relaxed and willing enough to feel safe to then go a little internal that makes sense Yeah. And I remember, so you put the eye mask on and you put the headsets on and then you journey through the music. And, and I say the word journey because it, it is this mix of, I I remember feeling as though, and and you said in this, um, in your zone of genius, this, um, I guess, trifecta of psychedelics, music and emotions. And in that I've sat many plant ceremonies there that day I was essentially accessing my own breath, the music and my own emotions. So there was no psychedelics involved. However, I was felt as though the music did take me on a journey that I got to work out some challenges that I was experiencing. It was that moment of rest and relaxation. Also feeling connected to a group of people because they were essentially riding the same ride. If, if it's almost, I like to think of we deepen sometimes as like this, if, if one day, I, like in my, my big imagination visions, it's like the next Disney world and like, <laughs> and, and Zendo stereo is one of the rides that you can mm-hmm. take. And 
Um, so, so it was like, we're all on this ride together. And then when everyone comes out, I mean, to see, I think we even captured so many like video testimonials of people experiencing the breakthroughs at, at the end of a Zendo stereo, everybody does actually get to share. They have the opportunity to share what they experienced. Mm-hmm. And it was beautiful because you, you mentioned emotions and people mm-hmm. would have tears. They would feel connected, even though they were in their own individual journey, um, mm-hmm. which some of it in, in our mix of, you know, in my um, utopia mind about oneness, mm-hmm. um, it's, it, it's it's like you can go out and you can have these social experiences, but in your own autonomy and sovereignty at the exact same time, which is a beautiful dance of of socializing. You know, yeah. you don't uh, you don't have to get right, like socially awkward in, in those moments. Yeah. It's like a great it's, place to go and be social without feeling socially awkward. Mm-hmm. And, and it's by design, though, because like my one of my inspirations was festival culture, you know. And I was I've been a musician my whole life, so a tour that I know the power of being on stage and sort of like you know, there's four people on stage and there's five thousand people in the room, but those people are literally reacting to this you know thing that I wrote in my bedroom by myself, <laughs> right? But here we are on stage, louder and bigger with the lights and the smoke, and which is being transported to this feeling that the, the writer usually has, right? And the, the real, the, the feeling, the more the connection you get with an audience, right? Regardless of what the feeling is, you know, clearly on a metal show, anger is the, the main flavor, right? But you can go to, I don't know, see, I'm trying to think like, you know, London Grammar is like the soaring sort of beauty about heartbreak, right? So so the, the thought was to your point is that, yeah, bring people in there where I, I gave a talk at MIT back in, February 2020, right before the bomb went off. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I was invited to talk about what I'm doing. And the name of the talk was, uh, uh, what was it? It was uh, uh, Consciousness, Alter States, Music and Meditation, right? So this idea was that the consciousness and the brain. And so I was saying, well, your brain is an electromechanical organ, right? So it's a piece of wet meat with electricity in it, <laughs> All right? Uh, so then if your thoughts create emotions, right? If you think of something, you put yourself emotionally in that space. And then the emotions create neurotransmitters, right? So if you're angry, you know, your neuroporin and your dopamine goes up, right? But if you're like calm and loving, your melatonin, your serotonin comes up and your oxytocin, right? So then the thoughts create emotions. The emotions create neurotransmitters, which are now it's actually a little, like, you know, more of this chemical is being created in your system and your neurotransmitters alter our biology, right? A calm body can digest food better. You know, a, 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 an anxious body, maybe you're not getting the nutrition, even if you're eating the same food you did yesterday, right? Uh, so then basically the neurotransmitters alter our biology and then the brain changing is what neuroplasticity is, right? So if we can change our biology and our emotions with our thoughts to create spaces in which that is the mindfulness piece, right? When I create a space in which in this thing, you get to feel these emotions, Right. And music being a great sort of a magnet to bring stuff to the surface because it, I've, this is part of my intro speech. We have very few spaces in society to feel our emotions, right? You can't just cry at Trader Joe's. You're just there to get your chips and salsa, right? Uh, you can't cry at work, right? You're supposed to be here. We're capitalists. We got to do the thing, right? Uh, usually you go home, everyone's in the best behavior, you know? And so then when do you get to experience extreme joy and extreme sadness, right? It's like one hour a month with your therapist, you can cry and the therapy, that's okay. Or you would pay $2,000 and spend the week going to the middle of the desert to go to Burning Man to get on a bicycle and giggle like a five-year-old, right? We give permission there, but we don't have permission anywhere else. So my mission was sort of to create a space in which like an hour or three hours or whatever the music therapy ceremony, as I like to call them these days, the music ceremonies, right? So the music is sort of the sacrament, even though you can add enhancers to that experience. And we can talk about that in a little bit. But the idea is like the permission is you're safe, set and set in, the door is closed. I'm sitting up watching everyone. No one's going anywhere. No one's going to touch you or your things. There's no tigers. So just relax. And let the music suggest what's underneath it. And this is your chance to feel it. Now, we think music is sad or happy. Music isn't sad or happy. You are sad or happy. You have sadness and happiness inside of you. And then music allows you to access that. So 
I was I would always say that here's this little you know tiny piano with a violin, and if you're sad, oh, that's the sadness coming. But if you just fell in love. All of a sudden, you're like, oh, that reminds me of my love, you know. And you kind of go, in, so you can, I can see literally this person is crying and this person is giggling. Send track. What's going on there? Well, that person finally got to have a cry about who knows what they're crying about. And this person is just so joyous about life that any music, you no, know, not any music, but that music brought into that place. And even joy, we don't get to experience. It's not just the negative emotions, the positive emotions, right? With that movie Inside Out from Pixar identifies five emotions. But the truth is we have like an easy 30 you can get to and probably more if we can name them, right? So it's not just sadness. There is anguish and there is hesitation. There is, you know, whatever. Like, you know, there's so many on the spectrum of happy and sad, right? Which are, they blunt our ability to fine tune how we're feeling because we almost don't have words for it. So just to do it without words and just feel things and not even judge them because part of the music is just moving forward. So my job is not to keep you in any given place too long, but to keep you there long enough to get something from it. So you have something to push. And I would say, if you feel an uncomfortable, lean into that discomfort. Why is this song bugging you, right? Or it's too happy or it's too sad. Is it? Are you too happy or too sad? <laughs> you know, is that a problem for you to be too sad? Or is that a problem for you to be too happy? Or oh, this song is, is silly. What's silly about it? So I always encourage curiosity and just, you know, leaning in, much like in a psychedelic journey, right? You see this, you know, rabbit with a hat and a clock. You should ask him, hey, what's going on here? <laughs> you know, mm. get curious rather than be like, there's no rabbit with hats, you know, uh, which is our logical mind versus like, maybe this is a symbol. Maybe this is a whatever a piece of information that only comes in this abstract form. So to answer, to go back to the beginning of the questions, like, yeah, the container is set up so that this magic can happen inside of it. Mm, this is totally your zone of genius, for sure, of everything that you, <laughs> you do as Zendo. I mm. appreciate also, too, the, 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 you know, when you had said psychedelics and music and emotions, my mind went to, hmm, why didn't he cl- include the mind? But as you as I heard you sharing about uh, ab- about the emotional component to a Zendo stereo journey, I heard you speak to of you know the the, the minds your thoughts is actually what creates the emotion, which then ties everything together. And I can see how a a, a Zendo journey gives the space for one to be in the state of contemplation. Mm-hmm. to contemplate yeah. their own experiences, what they're feeling. It is uh, a therapeutic modality uh, that you're mm-hmm. providing for people. And because we deepen, you know, what I like to pride ourselves on is um, we don't promote any event or many experience. We promote the best. And Zendoster is one of the best and networking uh, you and the other facilitators together. And yesterday I was on the phone with uh, Jessica Coleman, who is the creator of the magic of human connection, which is another amazing experience. I love seeing, you know, Zendo Sierra and the magic of human connection, all of you guys together under, you know, this umbrella. And what Jessica had said to me um, as she was sharing about her work is that, um, you know, people go to you know, a couple, will go to therapy to remove challenges. However, you can, to work on your relationship or to become more closer together, you can remove the challenges and also you can bring more joy into a relationship. So mm-hmm. it's, it's this process of removing, removing the challenges and bringing more joy. And mm-hmm. as I, you know, as I think about a Zendo stereo experience, it is that yes, you're you're feeling in the sadness and your your or whatever emotion that is coming your way, but it also is this space. I love how you speak about joy um, or these positive emotions to harness to, to access them on deeper and deeper levels. Mm-hmm. Which from my understanding, from my own personal experience, it's like a lot of the psychedelic revolution and these medicines that are being used, especially ketamine, for example, which I did last year with Dr. Philip Wolfson up in San Francisco. He's like the godfather of ketamine assisted therapy. 75-year-old man, he's been doing it since the 80s. Great bedside manner, can 
I love that man. But anyway, so there's this idea that, you know, with this medicine, ketamine specifically, which has both a very good research, you know, scientific chemical, you know, function that it's doing, but it also has like a spiritual aspect of it, right? So the on the chemical way, what it's doing is decreasing the activity of your brain, right? So what happens on depression or anxiety, your older brain, your milgada is overactivated, right? So anxiety overactivated is like, yeah, if there's a threat, anxiety is great because it tells you to get out of the way. Well, when anxiety is overactivated, you just think there's always a threat. You know, same thing with depression. Depression is a reaction. So I'm just going to stay small. This is my safety zone. Any move feels painful or challenging, so I'm not going to do that. Your prefrontal, which is the front of your brain, is the logical part, can look around the room and say, there's no threat here, right? But why is that not happening? Well, because we're so overactivated that the old part of the brain or the, the memory, the ancientness is literally taking over your ability to think that in this room right now, it's just me sitting in a chair. So why is my heartbeat racing and anxiety? Well, because I'm having a panic attack because my brain is convinced that something terrible is going to happen to us, right? Well, the prefrontal is like, I'm telling you, dude, there's nothing in this room, <laughs> but you don't get to hear that. So ketamine as an anesthetic and as a disassociative literally turns down the, elect the electrical currency all around the prefrontal and your, your ancient brain, right? So that's why the disassociative is like, I'm trying to hold the thought and I can't. Good, let it go. <laughs> you know, so what happens in that, in that journey, the music and this idea of feelings just being felt without attachment to them allows that brain to still feel like, oh, great, I'm being acknowledged. I am afraid right now. And then your prefrontal can then have a cool, thank you for trying to keep me safe. I'm safe now. You know, I'm just going to go about my day and then you start, you start a better dialogue with yourself. That's why like the week or two after the ketamine assisted uh, treatment or therapy, you do feel lighter and it's like your situation didn't change. Your problems are still there. Your ability to deal with your problems got better. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's not a cure for all. You still have to engage with the world. If you're having relationship troubles and you do ketamine, it doesn't erase your relationship troubles. It gives you the ability to make a decision, however hard that may be, including I'm going to stay and make this work or I'm not going to stay and I'm going to be in grief and pain, but move on and do what's best for me. That's not the ketamine doing it. That's you doing it. But the ketamine gave you a break and it made you, and I love how the, the doctor's like, just feel good and be in the bliss of this medicine that is the medicine. You don't always have to be reliving your childhood trauma to heal it. Sometimes what you do is you need to add more joy to balance that trauma. The trauma is always going to be there. You can't get rid of it. It's who you are. You don't want to get rid of it. You know, it's where your wound is. It's where your magic comes from, right? That's the Carl Jung ability, the, 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 the theory of the shadow, right? It's like the idea is not to cut the shadow and throw it in the garbage. That's what we all do wrongly. And then, of course, it comes back in the middle of the night and <laughs> bites us in the face because you cannot get rid of anger and jealousy and envy or whatever. You can work with it. You can acknowledge it. You know, it's like you invite it over to tea and then you're like, thank you for visiting. You may go now. Versus you can't come in the house. Well, get, they're going to start throwing bricks through that window if, <laughs> if you don't let them in. So anyway, so the idea with the medicine is that the different medicines, different spirits and different qualities, right? With mushrooms, you are engaging more in the story. But with ketamine, you're not. You're letting go of the story, right? Mushrooms activate you. you it floods you with more chemicals to bring things to the surface that you may have been a little shyer about. To, to your point, this whole thing with the feelings, right? There, I did a lot of research on the, like the neurotransmitters and stuff. And the interesting thing that I found is that they say that it's most of our problems are avoidance of that feeling. The, the anger, as we experience, is like a serpent dopamine and uh, endorphins and neuropamine. So it's like, no, this is it. it's protection with this aggression, right? That's what anger is. Like, you do something, now I'm, oh, I'm going to clench my fist and we're ready to fight and we're going to do this thing, right? But most of us don't want to feel anger. I'd rather be zen and just, you know, it's okay. You know, no worries. <laughs> That's the, the mantra of every angry, inner angry person. No worries, right? No, there is some worries. You know, I wanted this thing and now it's not happening. If I allow myself to feel my anger, not express it, I don't have to go punching people in the face all the time to experience my anger. The neurotransmitter uh, full cycle of anger, as we understand it, is 90 seconds, which is a minute and a half. Now, that's a long-ass time, maximum. After a minute and a half, literally, there's not enough 
dopamine and whatever to continue that cycle. Mm -hmm. So if you really let it go for 90 seconds, you're good. And by let it go, be like, I'm going to go into the room and just I'm gonna breathe <laughs> and just be like, man, I'm fucking pissed up. And then like 90 seconds later, you could go back in the room and be like, anyways, now I can think, right? So, and that goes, most of the neurotransmitter pathways are not super long. Now we can ruminate and be in that thing over and over and over by sort of pushing it aside and pushing it aside and pushing it aside. And now you have a backup of probably years worth of anger, which is why, you know, childhood trauma is so, you know, prevalent in our lives because it, we haven't dealt with it. We were children. We didn't have the capacity to deal with it. You know, something happens to me as an adult. I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. But most of the time, it's not my adult mind. It's my child mind reacting to it, right? There is a kid that doesn't like to be done X to whatever that trauma is for you. And there's an adult that totally gets it. But then that, again, we're having this old brain, new brain sort of dance, right? And when they're good, they're good because you can you know, reach into that inner child. And that's what your creativity is. That's what your intuition is. That's what like your joy is. Get in a Burning Man and get in that stupid bicycle that's super janky and covered in dust. And it's a, literally a, a, a junkier piece. You've never been happier than riding on a $25 cruiser that you bought off of a homeless person in Venice, <laughs> right? But people would meanwhile have $3,000 bicycles made out of like, you know, moon rocks. And they're walking around with a scowl on their face, you know, riding this thing down the street versus like being a Burning Man with a $25 cruiser and you've never been happier what's happening there, right? It defies, isn't material things supposed to make me happy or whatever, the best of the best that I'm going to work really hard to have a $3,000 bicycle versus maybe you don't work that hard. Maybe you just enjoy what you have, right? Now I'm going a little too many tangents, but the idea of the practice is to touch and get back into that core of experience, which is ongoing. You're never going to win this game. It's a process, not an event, right? So even coming to a Zendo stereo, or an experience is meant to be a practice that you can do weekly, monthly, you know, however it's affordable to you in time and you know, money and resources or whatever. Uh, meditation daily, yoga weekly, uh, a journey monthly, playa once a year. You know what I mean? Like you can see how the calendar starts to fill with meaning, with meaning and meaningful uh, things, which include community. Uh, you know, I like how you say part of the thing of the journey that I like is that it is a group journey. And uh, I like much like we deepen where I think of it's like, it's, you know, you, you go quiet for a minute, so you can have inner resources and share. If you just put a bunch of people cold off the street in a room, what do they do? Hey, what do you do? What's your name? Where do you live? Let me start out where you are in the pecking order. Oh, you have something I need. You, I want to be your friend. You have nothing I need. Sorry, moving on. I'm being very generalized well if you come into a room the setup is the nothing is required of you you don't need to interact let's go on a journey and then when you come back from the journey i encourage you to share and then all of a sudden people are like i remember being seven years old and i was on a donkey and a hat flew off and uh, they couldn't find it and now they're telling this beautiful story or a dream they had or an idea or a passion so that's where you get to know people it's not like my name is Bob. I, live, I work in accounting and I'm 36 years old. You're like, well, that's freaking boring. My name is Bob and I'm an immigrant from Peru. My parents, my grandparents were shamans and you know, <laughs> we escaped the country in the middle of the night in the middle of a military coup. Holy shit, Bob. You know, <laughs> that's the story, right? So anyways, that's what I like to facilitate people's ability to open because now the cups are full and then they can share. Yeah, I love how you said that the the conversations and the connections are much more rich after shared experience. Mm -hmm. And also when people come out of that there's an openness. As you said, you know, you're you're almost um we're not every day walking around thinking about you know, our our the full spectrum of our life existence which to gives when we are in that space, the connection points open and you begin to also see how alike we are. Uh, so shared experiences for sure create deeper connections. Um, you know, so we, we kind of, we had said that psychedelics, music, emotions were, you know, in this encompassing your zone of genius. And we just brought psychedelics in to the conversation 
And I, um, I want to be, you know, conscious to introduce that topic, um, with in, including, um, I guess how that relates to a Zendo stereo and how that relates to your own personal zone of genius. And, and when I say zone of genius, that generally tends to be what someone's passionate about where their curiosity mm-hmm. has, um, driven them. So what, what is your personal experience with psychedelics? Uh, well, I was in a band when I was 18 years old in New York in the early 90s. And I was one of those kids that did not drink, did not smoke weed. Uh, you no know, rapes were happening and ecstasy was happening in New York in the 90s. And I made a choice. I was like, no, we're not going to do any of that stuff. My own personal trauma was that my loved grandfather died when I was like 10 years old of lung cancer. And I was like, I'm never going to smoke anything. And to this day, I never smoked anything. So I had a little bit of a personal sort of wound around substances. You know, he was an mm. alcoholic, liver, cancer, and all these different things, liver and lung cancer, right? So I spent my 20s and my early 30s never touching anything, totally immersed in that world. You know, music, every musician is doing everything. And I was just like, you know, as a point of pride, you know, I was like, kind of like, I'm just going to wait for the right time. I didn't know. I love the literature. You know, I've always read like, you know, the visionaries and, you know, Huxley and McKenna and the doors and whatever. And then 2006, a friend says, you should come to Burning Man. I was like, yeah, whatever, sure, I'll go. What's there for me? You know, I was so jaded. And I was very impressed. So I did my first two burns completely sober. And I loved it. But by the third burn, I was like, hmm, I wonder if there is, this is that moment. This is set and setting, right? This made sense. I'm safe. I'm in the middle of nowhere. I can afford to lose six hours of my life. And that's how I, I was introduced to psychedelics, especially like mushrooms and MDMA, which MDMA is not really a psychedelic. It's a heart opener. So those two drugs at the, or substances or medicines at the time, and I, w- I was super lucky. It was set and set in, and I had enough of my own knowledge about it so that I was never the person popping a random pill at a party. You know what I mean? I was mm. too, whatever, uh, paranoid or if you want to say, like I'm the type of person that likes to test things, which I think you can get a test kit for $20 online. Don't ever take anything without testing it first. It's just common sense, especially nowadays with the fentanyl and whatever. So I was, you know, I have very good, uh, you know, uh, harm reduction education. You know, there's uh, organizations like Dan Safe and the bunk police that sell kits online. They're totally legal to get. So that was one, number one. And number two, you can get a $15 scale from Amazon that measures, you know, milligrams. And anything you take, you should always measure. And I was like, oh, those two things were like mind blowing because it made me, be conscious and and very uh confident in what i was doing and how much i was doing so you can always take more you can never take less so the idea that people you always hear that story oh i just took a handful of whatever and i put it in my mouth it's like wow that's a russian roulette right there you can really damage yourself if you take five grams of mushrooms while you're watching you know whoever at the hollywood ball you know what i mean like (laughs) there's that's not a container for you to, to process things that may come up as an example, but you can take 1.5 grams of mushrooms and go to the Hollywood ball and watch whoever, and you're probably going to be fine. You know what I'm saying? So so my introduction was via festival culture. And also I was super interested in shamanic cultures and that kind of more uh, Eastern philosophies, Buddhism, Taoism. I love the native Americans. I love South Americans. And then eventually I got to do, you know, the ma- major plant medicines with proper shamans in South America, which was like, oh, okay, this is challenging and interesting. And I've been in therapy as an adult. So I also had that Western mind to mix and match. So you can see how it all starts to build to by 2006. I was like, you know, I want to do music, but I don't want to be in a band. I've been meditating since 2000. Five? No. Uh, yeah. 2005. Yeah. So now I've been, whatever, 17 years of meditation, doing Vedic meditation, which is like mantra based. Mm-hmm. So that brought me to the mindfulness and I saw the results in my life. You know what I mean? Like uh, I'm 49 and I have no wrinkles in my face because think meditation works. <laughs> um, I can vouch for that. There are no wrinkles on your face. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so anyhow, it's, and it's not like a vanity thing. It's like, wow, my insights and my my physiology, like this whole idea of the brain, emotions, neurotransmitters, biology, it is connected. And it's so much research around it too, right? 
so the psychedelics became you know a, a tool for myself i always say like it took me you know three years to travel from my forehead to my heart you know and like i'll credit mdma with that in my early 30s where i thought i knew how deep i could go with things but i realized oh shit there's still a lot of gardeners around there you know being a male being a foreigner being the weird kid from you know whatever New York in a band wearing black my whole life, which I always thought it was fine. But then I realized, oh, this is also part of my trauma, right? I Every day someone asks me, where are you from, right? And they mean it so innocently because I have an accent, but every day I'm reminded I'm not from here, <laughs> right? That's what where you're from tells you. You're not from here. And people are curious. And most of the time- Where are you from? Very bit, I'm from Argentina. <laughs> so I came here when I was 13 with my parents to New York. And now I've been living in LA since 2002. So that foreign immigrant experience is very fresh to me because I've moved as an adult on my own accord across the country from my family to sort of seek out this beauty that is LA, right? And LA being the gateway to this you know, mindfulness and psychedelic and music, obviously. And that it's a very interesting place right now, I think, with a lot of great things that are happening, both from education, that people are doing like very good training around you know, the plant medicines or the, the psychedelic uh, or therapies or the therapeutic benefits of the combination of, of both, you know, I mean, and I think music, it plays a huge role in that experience. You know, typically, most of the experiences is you with headphones and a blindfold, <laughs> listen to music on the medicine, because you can't really talk when you're in the medicine. The processing is more internal. Afterwards, you're softer, you can bring stuff up. Usually beforehand, you journal, you set intentions, set and set in there's a little bit of talk to bring stuff up. But even when I did you know, the therapy with the doctor, the doctor is very short. He's like, listen, I just saw now where you are mentally and everyone has trauma, right? We live in an environmental collapsing moment with the economics and the COVID. And it's like, if you're not traumatized right now, you're not paying attention, right? So to be human nowadays means that we need to de-stress and we need to bring it down a little bit. We need to self-regulate, right? To your point, uh, the group thing, there's a whole polyvagal uh, nerve theory. Have you heard about this? A little. Tell me, tell, tell me again. So po- polyvagal therapy uh, or the polyvagal theory is this idea we have a nervous system, right? And we always think our nervous system is purely our own. But it turns out that actually we co-regulate all the time with everyone around us, right? So if you can self-regulate via meditation and the Zender stereos and the we deepens and all these different practices, you come in at a baseline, which is way more calm, let's say, right? That's just from a from a brainwave perspective. The better brain is your brain being awake and that's like a lot of activity. Alpha brain, you no, know, the meditation slash sleepy slap calm, right? It's like we're just gonna bring it down a little bit, slow down our breathing, slow down our electricity in our brain. And then you get to theta and delta, which are like the deeper meditation. So that happens is if you walk into a room where someone is super activated and anxious and you're about the edge of activated and anxious, they can just whoop, bring you to that anxiety place. And not both of you are anxious. So you walk into a room, your boss is pissed off. Oof, you get into the defensive. He sees you defensive. He gets more pissed off. You get more defensive. Now you're fighting, right? With your partner, with your boss, because you're not co-regulating. You, you're literally regulating to the thing that's a little more out of control. Now, if you really are coming in at a chill place and your boss is angry, you can then be like, hey, I see you're a little angry. You want to take a minute and take through the breaths or whatever is available to you or with a partner. So we are co-regulating. We can do it verbally, but we do it invisibly all the time, right? You walk in, this is like mass hysteria. Everybody's at a concert, everybody starts singing, right? In pitch, perfectly, right? Well, because we're all co-regulating to that moment of that elation and joy, just like in a mob, right? Next thing you know, people are like beating somebody with a stick. You're like, what just happened here? Well, we co-regulated and our nervous systems felt the threat. And then somebody says, it's that guy. Next thing you know, that guy's getting beat up. And he was like, I was just standing here. I don't know what happened. I just got, you know, whatever. So this idea where, parents and children co-regulate you can totally see that right mom picks up the baby baby gets on on the breast it's feeding mom is calm baby's calm oxytocin is going back and forth both of them are co-regulated mom is stressed out baby starts crying mom gets more stressed out baby cries more now we've got this you know anxious attachment <laughs> and all these different things that are happening so it's obvious in a parent child but we also do it all the time with each other Right. And that's where certain people, i.e. the Ram Dasses of the world, so the Dalai Lamas, I believe, have such a good base of that 
sort of t- tank full kind of thing, right? They, for whatever reason, they've done so much work in that area that when they walk into a room, everyone always says, oh my God, you walked into a room with Ryan Das was and you could feel something was different. You hear this all over and over from various people, you know, the Oshos, the Dalai Lamas or whatever, the Pope even, right? <laughs> And it's like, are they holy people or are they just people that regulated the system so well that this spread that calm and that chill mm. to as many people? And that creates a wave of that feeling. And then we call them holy men or women. But I also think that we can all do that in our own little ways. You know, we all have that favorite teacher that we liked. What was the teacher doing? Was he better at math or was he better at regulating a room that when you walk into the room, you were like, oh, I've, I'm sucked at math. By the way, I personally did, but I love my math teacher. There was something about Dr. T- Mr. Tasha that to this day, I remember his demeanor and how he presented this complex mathematical stuff, but he was such a chill human that I wanted to be in that class. <laughs> you know what I mean? So as, a, as an example, so when you think about, you know, when you meet that therapist or you meet that facilitator, you know, the Christina's of the world and the leaders of the world, our job is sort of like, I'm going to do as much as I can for myself, the self-care part, which I have issues with, and we can talk about it in a minute. <laughs> and uh, the point of self-care is like, you know, the metaphor is that was when the oxygen mask comes on, you're supposed to put it on yourself first, and then you put it on those next to you. My, my gripe with that metaphor is a lot of times people think, oh, self-care means I'm going to put the mask on myself, and then I'm going to read a book. And the whole work can set in fire because I'm taking care of myself which is kind of like the darker narcissist as aspect of that, right? The idea is like, yeah, fill up your cup so you can be of service. And there right now it's like, there's a weird, I think a confusion moment where some people do take that self-care to the extreme. And I think there's people always complaining about this narcissism that people have, right? And I think it's a little bit of that human instinct not being, it needs to be educated that you understand why you're doing things, you know, and how you're doing, what's happening when you're co-regulating or you're self-regulating, right? The point of self-regulation is that when I walk into a room and bring a little bit more calm, I'm not like the Dalai Lama. That's not the goal. The goal is to be the best Christina you can be. And my goal is to be the best Leo I can be or Leo, as I like to call myself for once in a while. <laughs> I've been doing this whole thing where my real name is Leonardo, right? Like Leo is my name. So I came here when I was 13, I started calling me Leo. And I was like, sure, I'll answer to Leo. And not too long ago, a couple of years ago on a journey, I was in a deep medicine work and it came up like, oh, my inner child doesn't speak English. Leo means nothing to anything younger than 13 year old Leo because Leo didn't exist. So it was weird, like, what the, you know? And since then, I tried to introduce myself as Leo more often. And not that to change my name per se, but to kind of like play it back and forth with that. And it's interesting, new people that don't know me as Leo, they just hear Leo. Leo is the name, right? Uh, I'm not asking you to change it, but if you want to from now on. <laughs> I love, I love Leo. And I uh, appreciate a lot of what you have just shared. All mm-hmm. fascinating a couple of things that come to mind is around, you know, I, I love people. I really do. And, and also it's so important. The reason I can say that I love people is because I get to be in these spaces where I am comfortably regulating with others. Like it, when I'm doing the quote unquote work and others are doing the work, whether we're in a workshop or transformational experience together. Uh, but I do notice that that I, I'm, I'm currently studying with IPAC. I'm getting my certification, a CPC certification, certified professional coach. Mm-hmm. And that's a, a nine-month program. Uh, and everybody in the program is focused on increasing their their levels of, of energy. I, I will speak about this in a future podcast, but there are seven levels of energy that is taught through IPAC. And when you have a group of people who are doing work on themselves and are aiming to, um, to elevate their own individual consciousness, to do that quote unquote self-care, uh, it's, it's, it's just, I, I think that to be, super aware of the environments that we are putting ourselves in 
uh, because that is essentially whether it's that level one energy, which is to say is like this victim energy. Level two is the conflict energy. And as you keep moving up to getting to those higher states of, you know, level six of that joy and wisdom and seven unconditional love, uh, the, the people that you're surrounding yourself with are just so important uh, for our own um, regulation of our systems. And it also even speaks to um, this idea of oneness that we all mm-hmm. are feeling what other people are, are feeling. You also do, um, uh, you know, you're, you're speaking about the, the self-care and it's interesting. You brought that up in the whole airplane thing, because I personally, uh, you know, I go back and forth. I always struggle with that. I studied Kabbalah for years mm-hmm. and in, um, you know, there's, there's this idea of that sort of like a, a burning man culture that you, that we all like, if in, if in a village, a village was created and if everybody brought their own individual gifts to the village, um, mm. and it wasn't based on, you know, monetary values, but it's more of, a contra- um, contributing to the, uh, the, the, evolution well being yeah the well being the evolution of that society or that community if y- if you like i like when i think of love i think of putting other people first so i sometimes struggle with the idea of the face mask on first because i would love to live in my whole utopia world is that we're all putting each other first and so I don't have to put my own self first because you're going to put me first and you're going to put me first. And so I'm always mm-hmm. taken care of. Now, that doesn't mean that um, I'm not going to go to yoga today or I'm not going to, you know, take my bath or my shower because I'm going to, you know, that I'm going to do that for myself because that allows me to show up for you better. And maybe that's where the, the face mask aspect actually comes in. Uh, yeah. But I do can relate to you of, you know, the the um, feeling sometimes that we twist it, the idea of self-care mm-hmm. and it's about caring for yourself can, so you can be more of service to can others. Can I add a, a, a brief addendum to that metaphor? That metaphor specifically works because it goes in case of an emergency, put the mask on yourself first. So when the shit hits the fan, and your stress is trigger. Don't go, oh, I can't deal with my emergency right now because I'm going to go three seats over here because this person is having an emergency. Because at that point, you're not coming from a place to truly be able to serve because now you're like, I'm depleted, so I'm going to be resentful or I'm going to do this poorly. I'm going to do this with a, an energy, a fuel that's dirty fuel versus the clean fuel, right? Which I think that's why I love the metaphor you know what I'm yeah. saying? If everything yes. is cool, then we don't need masks. We're all fine. <laughs> totally. Yes. I, I love that you added it in because of even two of, you know, our stress responses, when we're in stress response, we tend to go to that level one, level two energy, which is that victim or conflict energy. Mm-hmm. And um, as you said, walking away that 90 seconds, walking away and breathing to come back, to have a clear mind, to actually be able to do the work. So it's, it's almost like when you're in a stress state or when you're in an emergency, put your... Mm-hmm take care of yourself so you can then show up for, for others. So I want to, um, I Actually, guess before, before you, before you move forward, yeah. I have a great bit that I used on the MIT presentation, which was the meditation as an altered state, right? So an altered state, you would think, Oh, we take a substance, we get altered. Now we're in this other state, but meditation and altered states kind of do s- something similar. And I have, so you go from fight or flight, which is our stress response to stay and play. Same situation, but instead of fight and flight, if fight and flight, I'm going to stay and play. I'm get curious. I'm going to ask, hmm, what's what's this? What's some information here? So you decrease an overactive stress response with both meditation and an altered state. If you're safe, you're feeling challenged, maybe physically challenged, right? But you, you're going to decrease the overactive stress response. So then you create mental fitness and by observing your thoughts, right? So this idea that like, why am I feeling this? Versus like, oh, I'm feeling this. I'm going to fight or flight. No, I'm feeling this because hmm, it's reminding me of something. It's not here. It's reminding me. So even that thought, right, to kind of bridge the gap between that emotion, which seems overwhelming, and your logical mind, whatever little of it you have in both meditation and altered state, which is softer, just says it's okay. So the emotional regulation is 
doesn't mean emotional stifling, it means the appropriate emotional response, right? Sometimes anger is the appropriate emotional response. You need to set a boundary. And if you whisper your boundary, no one can hear it sometimes. Sometimes you got to really say it a little louder, <laughs> right? And that's okay if it's in a safe container and the other person can hear you now. It's like, hey, this is very important to me and I'm sorry I'm going to get a little activated, but it really pisses me off when this happens. You're not a bad person, but I need to also speak to this because if I don't, you don't know and you can't help me. That's a, a appropriate emotional response. So it's not about controlling your emotions, it's about observing them and then acting with the right amount of agency or the right amount of like uh, what do you call it pressure right you know it's like somebody said uh, i love this metaphor it was like four ounces is a random number of pressure it's like if you have a balloon that's floating and you smack it real hard it just wobbles and it kind of stays where it is but if you gently push the balloon it will go across the room right so the amount of pressure you can put on something it has to be the right amount too little doesn't move too hard it just fights you back right you know what I'm talking about? If you smack a balloon, it literally just wobbles in the place. It doesn't move because you're not giving it like the, the pathway or the correct, like gentle pressure. Gentle being a subjective word. Sometimes the gentle pressure is to be angry and to raise your voice and to take a stand because maybe they've never seen that part of Christina. And to them, it's like, oh, shit, I didn't mean to do the thing that now you're telling me I'm doing because to me, that's not my trigger. So I leave my socks everywhere, but to you, that is a trigger. So you're asking me not to leave my socks over there. And if I hear you, I'll make a conscious effort to not leave my socks over there. That's a dumb example, right? But out of those little dumb examples is where divorces happen, right? And where breakups and all these different things. It's like, it starts little. It's never like everything is perfect and it's one thing burns down the house. It's usually like, you know, the aggregate of those little transgressions that we do and not taking care of ourselves and not asking other people to take care of us because we're the regulator, right? Mm. So anyways, that's a, a bridge I, over I, there too. I, I, I love this um, analogy around the, the pressure and the gentle pre- pressure. I'm going to put a pin in that and come back to that in a moment um, mm-hmm. when we move on to this chapter two question, which is around how's your love life before I jump into that though, I, 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 I want to um, kind of close the the chapter on the correlation between our house psychedelics are, um, are considered with Zendo stereo. Mm-hmm. Um, so two things right now, we're still in the area of prohibition, right? So the disclaimer is, Theoretically, nothing can happen between the two of them. This is all happening in both like, you know, FDA approved trials, which by the way, they've been doing the same freaking trial now for 20 years. If I had to see one more headline that says mushrooms are 85% against the pressure versus Prozac, which is 2%, I want to jump out the window. And yet that's what we've been doing. We spent almost 30 years of research, which comes out over and over and over. It's safe. It's not toxic. It's super effective. It's helped millions of people. Nope, we still need to debate it a little bit longer, right? It's always next year. So that's my frustration. On the other side, there's stuff that, you know, my mother, my modality works without medicine. And yet people have access via whatever means they want to access these medicines via going to other countries or sometimes getting something from someone or whatever. Uh, ketamine is a legally prescribed psychedelic you can now go use telemedicine there's a company called wonder med which i think they're doing great work and you literally go online much like you get like your prescription for adderall or whatever you do an assessment you do telemedicine and they can ship you a lozenge or like four of them for a month so you could do a weekly journey with the medicine right and it's supposed to be supported by some counseling or your own therapist and whatnot one great way to use this medicine is to, let's say, do a Zendo stereo. You can come to a Zendo stereo and take your medicine, right? And go on this journey in a group setting. And then, you know, sort of imagine a group of people taking that medicine at once, which I have, because I was able to kind of arrange people that have that access to that specific modality. And then they got to have that experience. Or you can do it at home with, I have some mixers that I put on. SoundCloud, so if somebody reaches out to me, I can send you a private link and that way you can have that experience, right? Or even on a one-on-one that I can, let's say you don't want to do the group thing because you feel too intimidated or you want to be in your house because you want to be able to get up and go to your bathroom, <laughs> right? Which is totally legit. And for a lot of people, that is the entryway. So I have gone to people's houses and just done, you know, 
three or four hour music therapeutic ceremony in which they take the medicine that's you know appropriate for them. And all I'm doing is holding space, bring the lights and the eye mask and the pillow and the blanket and just create a little mini pot for them to sort of truly let go and go deeper into the meditation aspect, which is all framed. Like I say, it all works without medicine. The, the deep, the, the we deep in event we did was a medicine free event, but people had psychedelic experiences. So the beauty of it is if you did do, I would say, um, uh, an average or below average dose, because that's the whole point. You want to still be present to be able to receive the inner wisdom, right? Sometimes when the medicine is too deep or it's too too much, you kind of tend to be now a more struggling place. And that's where therapy comes in or a shaman tradition or a facilitator that's willing to hold that deeper sort of carving out of what needs to be carved out. And I think this, that's where I fully believe in the, you know, the therapeutic or the shamanic model I'm working somewhere in between, which is more of an introductory slash, you know, it works both ways, you know, and I leave it up to the individual because included, like you can take a THC gummy beforehand. I'm not, you know, I have no way. I'm just things that are legal and people have big epiphany healing journeys with THC or with CBD or whatever. Uh, and, and there's a whole microdosing mushroom thing that's going on. Everyone and, you know, Silicon, uh, Silicon Valley, Daniel Days, it's articles about, you know, Steve Jobs and uh, you know all these people who are super accomplished who literally use psychedelics as far as their like you know toolkit to access these places of creativity and intuition and calm and insight and healing, which is what I think that medicine is for. You know, so if you set and set in and set a real intention and don't make your only psychedelic experiences that one time at the Great for Dead concert to get type of acid, congratulations, you did something. But I take you know take you know two point five grams of mushrooms, sit on your house with your I don't know, blindfold and the, and the headphones on, and go on a journey and really sit with your feelings. Imagine MDMA, right? People take it at a, a concert. What do you do? Tell everyone you love them, right? Everyone feels super lovely, super. Imagine you're sitting there by yourself or with yourself, and you tell yourself you love yourself. You you get that feeling of what is this for love that I'm feeling? Oh, this is for me. Mm. That's you no, know, and you can give that to. Any part of you that didn't get enough love. And like if you're single, you're doing an intimate journey with yourself. Now you just had like a great love affair with yourself for the hour or two. Now you can you know you walk through the through the rest of your day with that confidence of that cup being full. So when you do meet that attractive stranger, now you come from a place that hmm, that's interesting. And they see you like that looks yummy. Like what's that person? <laughs> you know, what that self-love is the glow that we have that attracts other people, which maybe leads to the next question. <laughs> How's your love life? Love life is great right now. I uh I went through a difficult breakup last year, post-pandemic. I was depressed because my parents had COVID and I got a little PTSD from that. That's when COVID 1.0, when which 74-year-old parents getting COVID was like any day now, I get the text. And uh, that was very hard for me. I was in LA. They were in New York. So I couldn't be with them. Mm. So, you know, I did the little dark tea time of the soul, you know. And I felt like I spent a year grieving that relationship when we were in their relationship because it was uh, it was over and we knew it. And we kind of have to, you know, live together. Or so. so that was very painful. And, uh, and then I met this person that I had met through one of the Zendo Story events. She's also a, a sound healer. And we kind of met in May of last year. And we were like, okay, just stay in touch. And then come January, we were like, wait, there's something here. And like, it just kind of blossomed in this beautiful collaboration of alignment with both, you know, the sound and the stuff that we're really passionate about. And also just like the right time at the right place for the, for, for both of us, I was going to say. And, uh, Yes, yeah, so it feels very nice. It feels good to be supportive and independent. It's, I, I feel like, of course, your least, last relationship should always be the best one. <laughs> and this feels like the best relationship I've been in because I have all my own experience of my previous relationships. And ideally, I don't think there's a stigma to ending a relationship if that's what the the course of that relationship is. I have tried like you know, both monogamy and poly opening scenarios and combinations and i feel that my communication is better as a result of having tried that whether i'm now identifying as open or poly is a different story i feel like i'm 
not as identified as I used to be, but I keep a lot of those fundamentals, which is clear communication, open dialogue, directness, honesty, integrity, you know, hey, I'm having a difficult time with this thing. Great. Let me know. This is difficult. Okay, cool. Thank you for letting me know. Let's work on that, you know, and then don't be afraid to be vulnerable and to take chances and to ask for what you need, which is to me very difficult because I tend to be more of a caretaker type. So to be with somebody that's also a caretaker type, it's been great for both of us because we get to take care of each other. Mm. <laughs> right. Uh, in that way, but it's also a conscious choice. I, I came in and I announced, Hey, this is my tendency. Can we work on, you know, check me if you see me and I please make me, and she has done a great job of like making me ask or accept her help rather than be like, no, no, I got it. It's like, yeah, even if you got it, please make me happy to let me give you this gift, right? Rather than make yourself happy by not accepting my gift because then you can say, oh, I don't want to owe you anything, right? Versus like, it's not about owing. It's just, it's a flow. It's currency, right? It's like we, we are in this flow of choosing daily. Hey, you still want to do this? And like ask that question. And if the answer is fuck yeah, then that's a great answer. Don't be afraid to ask. I still want to do this. You know, ask yourself this idea of recommitting to the present moment, right? There is a Spanish uh, singer, Gustavo Cerati, that I love. And he has that thing where it's like, uh, I'll love you forever, but forever is now. So the only time I can love you is now. Like forever implies somewhere in the future. Like we think eternity is a thing that happens at the end, but eternity is happening right now, which I think is, you know, again, the mindfulness and psychedelics, it's like this richness of the present moment, whatever that is. When you are in the middle of a kiss, that's rich, but sometimes you're just brushing your teeth. So don't be craving the kiss, brush your teeth. <laughs> no. Yeah, I appreciate how wise you are. There's so many moments throughout this podcast recording that you have shared these nuggets. I mean, I think there's like nugget after nugget with inside <laughs> of this. Um, a, a couple of things of um, I, you know, and I'm finding the personal nuggets in. I really appreciate this, um, you know, the, the, the sharing before we got into the, the, the depthness of this question, but around the pressure um, around the, because I think that's also in, in our relationships that, um, that, that level of gentle pressure that we can, um, help to move through people through and en energetic challenges. Um, and also in how each of us come into our intimate romantic relationships with, you know, a history that is affecting us in every moment. And I think it's beautiful that, um, you and, uh, your new partner are, have, um, you know, have shared that both of you have been people pleasers in the past. And now you are in a practice of accepting support from the other. And sometimes in that accepting of the support from another is that it's a gift for the other person, because if, you know, you want to help me and I'm like, no, I don't know. I got it. I got it. I got it. Well, it's that, that no is restrict is, is, is essentially pushing the other person away to some extent. It's like, you know, you give somebody a gift and they're like, Ooh, I don't, you know, Oh, I don't like don't getting gifts. gifts. <laughs> I don't, I don't like getting gifts. Gifts make me feel uncomfortable. I'm like, well, the gift fucking isn't about you. It's about them. Let them give you the gift and enjoy the gift because there's two sides to this gift giving. It's not just about you receiving the gift. It's about the joy the other person is getting from giving you the gift. So there's actually a gift happening on both and the receiving of the gift is happening for both people when that gift is given. Uh, so I love that. And, and also too, is, uh, I'm, I, yeah, I, I can't imagine, um, the, the challenge and it completely makes sense to experience a breakup. And then your parents are, um, you know, struggling with COVID and aging parents. I mean, I'm in my, um, early forties now, and I can say is, is my parents are aging and, you know, I, I, I am also exploring this new partnership with somebody and, um, and there was periods before him and I met where I was, um, you know, in aware, aware of, um, of the aging cycle of my own parents and 
was consumed by it at times. And that Mm -hmm. does affect, it's kind of like, you know, everything is connected in some sense. It's hard to go out and be like, let's have a romantic dinner and start a new partnership. Fuck my parents, my father's dying or something of that sort. You know, it's (laughs) it's just, it just, everything is interconnected and and woven. Uh, So congratulations on this new exploration, Mm -hmm. whatever it Mm -hmm. becomes. And Mm -hmm. um, it's been helpful for me to hear um, yeah. what you're experiencing. So this next question. Can, can, can I speak a little yeah. bit before we move on to what you're saying about the, the sort of like the, the aging and decaying, if you want to say, of the, the, the mortality of our parents or our older generations coming online, right? And it's interesting because people in their 20s and 30s usually have children, right? And you think about like, you know, you have children as your parents are aging. They are, they're the grandparents, right? So their aging still moves forward, but I always love this. I forget who said it, but it was like this idea that you need to be able to hold a baby in one hand at your parents' funeral. You have this deep grief because mom and dad are now passing on, but this baby brings you joy and love and this deep reverence for it, right? So the other side of love is not hate, it's grief, right? So the amount of how much love you can have is how much grief you're going to have for this thing because by the nature of everything being impermanent, which is a you know, Buddhist truth, right? We forget that and we get very attached to it. It's like, oh, mom and dad are going to be around forever, right? And it's like, if you had a calendar, it would show you how many weekends, how many summers you have left with them. If you look at the calendar, you already have 40 something, but now you have like 10 left, right? Which is terrible, not terrible, but it, it's sad. And it, it, but it's also like, oh, how rich that I still have 10 left, right? So to be able to hold... The, the joy of the new relationship, which is not necessarily physically a baby, but it's, it's a baby in like there's something new being born. It's a new business, it's a new idea, a new friendship, a new place you move to. And at the same time, hold the grief of, oh, mom and dad are aging. Any day now, I'm going to get a phone call that I'm not going to like. That's going to be a very difficult. That's what happened when my parents got COVID. My sister and I had to have to talk like words, mom stuff. And I was like, holy shit, I don't know. And then my sister has COVID too, and she has a three-year-old daughter, mm-hmm. and she had to have the conversation with me. This is in December 2020, where there was no vaccine or anything like that, where people were getting it on Thursday and dying on Saturday. Mm-hmm. So my sister got it on Thursday, and on Saturday she had the conversation. If anything happens to me, you need to take care of my daughter. And I'm like, holy reality check. <laughs> of course, I said yes without hesitation, but the, the heaviness of that, that's where the, the heartbreak and the PTSD came from. On the other side of that is, oh my God, when I got to fly to New York that spring and see them, oof, talk about like, you know, like that phone call by my mom after she was gone for 12 hours in the hospital system that we could not find her because it was like chaos in New York. There was like morgues in the parking lots and they just came, got my mom, took her an ambulance and that's it. She was gone. Mm. So we assumed the worst <sighs> because we didn't hear back for 12 hours. Finally, 12 hours later, they say, oh, she had a heart condition. We stabilized it. We're going to keep it here for a week. And you know, we're going to watch her. She's going to be fine. We're like, whew, thank God. Three hours later, they call us back. Actually, we just tested her. She has COVID. She needs to get out of here right now. Your father, who probably has COVID too, needs to come and get her. So my 75-year-old dad went to become my 73-year-old mom when they both had COVID. And they could not stay in the hospital because they had no COVID beds. And because she wasn't having COVID complications, they couldn't keep her on their cardiac. So all these complications, right? The point of this is like, oh, this deep grief, this deep, even like primal your caretaker is gone. The person who gave birth to you may not be here. And we're all going to experience that, hopefully, in that order, right? Sometimes the parents lose the children, which is a whole different kind of heartbreak. But the point of this is like the, the dance of the present moment is that you literally can hold both. You can hold the deep, great joy of this new love and the sensuality and sexuality even of it. It's like, oh, to be physical, it's really connected. And it's like, you know, it feels hedonistic almost. Like, how could there I have whatever, two hours of luscious lovemaking while the world is on fire. It's like, what else is, you, by doing that, you add in that good juju to the world, right? You add in that bliss and that joy that when you are called to take care of and the phone call comes, hey, mom is gone. You can take that call because your cup, hopefully is as full as it can be with that joy and love. And you can feel supportive and connected to somebody. And you can then be like, hey, partner I like how we haven't used our names to protect their privacy <laughs> you know uh 
And then that person can be like, yeah, please accept my gift. And my gift is you don't have to do anything for the next 24 hours. I will make your meals and you can just sit in the couch and be, you know, an amoeba <laughs> with all your feelings because this is not the time for you to be productive. This is the time for you to be in your feelings because if you're not and you switch right into, I'm going to get this thing. Let me put this mask on. And Christina keeps a smile on. The show must go on. Guess what? The show is not going on. Now Christina shows up a little janky and a little snippy and a little snatchy and a little whatever. And Leo does that too, right? You know, so then hence the brings us back to the big theme of this podcast, like this idea of the emotion processing or you know, the emotion uh, uh, appropriate emotional response and how important that is, right? And then kind of doing that where we can continue to bring that and realize that it's a it's a process. Again, you never win. It's like yoga. You don't win yoga. It's not like, ooh, that's it. <laughs> Today is my last yoga class. <laughs> yeah. No, it's like, yeah. nope. Today is my last, the last time I feel grief. Mom and dad are both dead. I'm done with it. Nope. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I grieve when David Bowie died. That's if like, one of my relatives died. I grieve when Gustavo Cerati died. You know, it's like, and you don't have to grieve when people die. You can grieve when people, you lose a job or you change jobs or your favorite show ends, right? It's a moment of grief, you know? So grief and love and all this. No, daily, just feel it all, you know? Mm, feel it all, feel it all. So in in two minutes or less, mm-hmm. I want to get into the Zendo stereo we deepen. Sure. Two, two minutes or less, why do you do what you do? Uh, early on when I became a graphic designer, somebody asked me that question back in my late 20s after being in the band. And I was like, honestly, I think what I like to do is bring a little bit more beauty and joy to the world. That's literally, it's like a sandcastle on the beach. I know that the waves are going to come and take care of it or whatever. It's it's not permanent, but why not? Why not add a little bit more peace, a little bit more quiet with the full knowledge that the balancing after the universe is going to happen regardless. I just want to be on team bliss and beauty and calm as a way to counter my own lack of bliss, beauty and calm. So if I can facilitate that for others, I feel like that is, uh, you know, a, a calling or a passion rather than a job, right? It's not my job to do Zender Stereo. It's my calling to do Zender Stereo, right? And just that, just a little bit, you know? And like, it's never done, <laughs> you know? I do my best. I improve. The only person I'm beating is myself. I want to do a little bit better than I did yesterday. I'm not trying to achieve George Clooney's status of anything, right? <laughs> George Clooney is this ideal of the charming, rich, successful, talented human, Maybe, you know, I'm sure he has his challenges and I have mine. So that's what I do what I do. I think I like to bring a little bit more of, of this little, like I think joy, beauty, those two words really, you know, resonate with me. Uh, you know, bliss also does you know, make, make, make that three. Joy, beauty, and bliss. And it's like joy, you can do it with art. Bliss. Yeah, you do it with art, you do it with music. I mean, I'm also a web and graphic designer. And it's like every time I do a little piece, does this thing make the world a little nicer, a little more beautiful, a little more colorful. Even when it is a dark piece, is it more intense? Is it more, you know, does it bring an emotion up? And then that's my sort of daily call. You know, how do I do that? It changes from, you know, the medium or the the opportunity or the canvas or whatever, but the idea is to go in there, including with a friend, you know. It's it's like bioosmosis. You experience the, 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 beauty and the bliss and the calmness and joy in mm-hmm. your life as well. Yeah. So when the shit goes sideways, you had that in your tank, you can handle the shit going sideways. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. So we deepen in and Zendo stereo. I, you know, I, I mentioned um, to you, I believe over text message, you know, one of the things that is really exciting to me right now is I'm moving to Miami Monday. Mm-hmm. I drive my car from Maryland uh, to Miami, and I am going to be staying at a very special place called Agri Farms or Agri Retreats yeah. on on Instagram. And it's a space where Unleash was held. That's where I was introduced to the spot. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is five acres. There are there's glamping tents, container rooms, uh, a pool. Um, plenty of space to gather people. And I am excited to program the spot with 
retreats, workshops, mm-hmm. events. Now I know this is this expansion, you know, we deepen and you and I met here in Los Angeles. Um, so we are now expanding beyond, which I'm excited mm-hmm. because Los Angeles, why we love it, we get to, I mean, there is something going on there like all the time, conscious oriented and related. It's one of the most special places that I have felt, really felt the essence of community there. And in this expansion, we get to bring that to other markets now that, um, yeah, there's a lot happening in, in Miami. Uh, however, you know, this play, this space is 45 minutes west of South Beach in mm-hmm. the, the Redlands. Uh, so I'm excited to activate that spot. So let's put a mm-hmm. pin in that. Maybe there's a Zendo stereo retreat mm-hmm. in the future. Um, an, an overnight experience, whether you come and you facilitate that experience and potentially curate other um, facilitators that are a part of that to program, you know, a few days. Yeah. As well as, you know, future stuff, I would love to have a, a We Deep in. I envision having a We Deep in showcase and even an award show there at some point mm-hmm. where we mm-hmm. can recognize the greatest transformational experiences of our time. And in mm-hmm. doing so, I imagine Zendo Stereo to be a part of that. Um, once I make it to Miami, I, this can kind of all expansion. This all is like in my head. It's like, not necessarily like let's here's the mm-hmm. date and here's yeah, the time, here's the date, yeah. but as I continue to enroll more people into the vision, um, and get behind it, then I have greater support to make sure it happens and, and, and energetic of excitement. So those mm-hmm. things, um, are, are in my mind, we are also, you know, you're a part of the, we deepen WhatsApp group. I believe so. You're, you're yes. in that group. Yeah. And it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, you know, it's a WhatsApp group. It's like a bullet scrolling bulletin board. Yeah. Um, we are expanding into circle. Um, we're mm-hmm. using the community platform that I'm in the process of, of, of building right now, um, to, um, bring a more robust space for people who are traveling through the mm-hmm. social and transformational experiences that we promote to bring them into one central location um, mm-hmm. that, you know, there's a member directory, there's conversations. It's like our own mini private Facebook. And, and also in my, you know, viewpoint of looking at it, I imagine, I think people get lost in the online world of social media. And to me, if I could re-envision it, it would be a space that was like a tool for people who are actually engaging in real life Mm -hmm. uh, to then have this tool to remain in contact or to deepen when they happen to not be in person. Yeah. Let me just tag in here where I, I love the idea and we want to that we deep in as an experience that creates it's built of other experiences right and the combination of this experience can be powerful so for example i have done zendos in which i do movement and rework, breath work beforehand with a facilitator that really dials that in including with the headphones and people can just kind of like be in their bodies and go into the spirit you know, intellectual space or i'm doing stuff with my partner and we created this new sort of mini thing called ember like you know an ember and then the idea is that she's a sound healer and she's traditionally working with the balls and gongs and all the different you know smaller instruments and we want to create this hybrid of both vibration that you can hear you know without headphones and then go into a headphone space and without can whisper in your ear the, the instructions and then you can then be in that more internal space and then take the headphones off and come back to the to chimes and the rain drums and all these different stuff to sort of have a multi-sensory experience you know and i've also done uh, julia grace from uh, uh, uh the wave right we did a collaboration in which i kind of did more of a not traditional zander stereo but bringing some of that zander stereo philosophy to her sort of like dancing meditation that she does that i think they're great so i I hear you that the combination of all these things, you know, the movement or with the breath work, with the different modalities. And I think Zendo 
complements itself very well with that. So we deepen, you know, even if it's like speed dating, great, let's do a Zendo stereo an hour before the tantric speed dating. So that way, when that conversation happens, no one's saying, oh, I'm an accountant and you know, I'm 36 years old. Mm-hmm. It's more like, here's here comes the good stuff, right? To have that cup filled, especially after you did some, you know, movement and you're on your body so you feel like more present and then of course you can be present to the other person make eye contact (laughs) you know just little simple things that we do again the core regulation is the breath the smell the eye contact the you know even the no the heart rate that we don't we think no one else can see it but if we're activated it shows up right you're a little edgy (laughs) you know what i mean and if the other person is a little more calm you the edgy person can be like oh, this is safe. I'm going to just slow it down a little bit, right? And again, that core regulation we talked about. So mm. that's one thing. The other thing that I love is about getting off. What happened in social media, I think, this is my own personal Leo theory, you know, uh, which is, it was it was a fire hose, right? It came online. There was no real plan other than let's just get users and let's get everybody on it. And you can see how over the past 10, 15 years, you know, like Instagram, it's responsible for depression in teens in a disproportionate way, right? And like Facebook is a place to connect with everybody. It disconnected the world. It literally toppled democracies. And like, you know, it allowed all this crazy disinformation to go because it was a fire hose. You literally said yes to everything. Next thing you know, you're connected with people that from first grade all the way to last week. And it turns out that that wasn't healthy. It was a far, like right now, the idea that we need to, De- decouple from those platforms and i still love instagram and i love going in there promoting my stuff and there's a place for it but it is a fire hose right like you know you post something no one can see it because there's so much other garbage that it gets over so if i can log on to a circles and i have you know the we deep in and then the ember group and whatever and i'm like oh i want to see what's going on in ember and i click on ember and I get to see truly what Ember is doing because Facebook doesn't let you see what Christina is doing unless I go to the Christina page. So why don't we cut the middleman out? You know what I mean? Like we literally, at the internet became four websites. The internet is Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, maybe Google for search. That's it. How often do you go to Tushi? No, dot com, the place that does the bidets. Never, even though I love their product and I have one. How often do I just log to We Deepen? Most people don't because we log on to Facebook or whatever every day. A lot of us obsessively, right? So creating a, a platform that is not a fire hose, that's more like a spigot. I'm going to open it, I'm going to fill up my glass, and I'm going to close that. And I'm going to drink that glass and I'm going to walk away versus like a fire hose. It's not subtly. It's like, you know what I mean? Like, good luck closing it now, right? You ever seen those videos of the fireman struggling with the host? You know what I mean? Like, the, the host is so powerful that it takes three people to grab it, right? And I think social media right now is being weaponized. That is so much. Like, even if you don't want to engage, by virtue of being in it, you're engaging, mm. right? And we saw this whole, like, split with the pol- politics and the COVID and whatever. And we still haven't healed from that, I feel. I feel like there's still some work that I don't know what it is that we need to do collectively to kind of bring some common sense back, you know, into, I, I hate the centrist view. I don't think it's about centrism. I think it's about doing the right thing for what is right. I think both sides, unless you're on the very extreme, have valid points, right? And to be able to hear each other, which is again, co-regulating. It's like, I, I could probably sit down with a person from Alabama and totally get their whole abortion thing, but I bet you we can bring it to the middle and it's not really abortion. It's about safety and it's about, you know, being heard and being blah, 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 blah. blah. And they can religion. be places. Yeah, religion. And like the place like, oh, I, I want to respect your religion. It just happens not to be mine. So yes. I don't care about the dude in the sky with a beard. You know, I mean, just like you don't care about Taoism because there is no dude in the sky with a beard. So it's probably a difficult concept. So let's talk to each other. I was an ultra boy. I grew up Catholic. I know that whole thing. And yet somehow there, by virtue of my life, I can see both points. I don't agree with taking women's rights. That's a stance that I'm very clear on, regardless of political thing. You know, taking rights away has never worked out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's just it's just not a good I mean you can fine-tune that and you can make you know specific requests about your safety and health that you feel benefits you and your community, including that community deciding for themselves that in our community we don't want to do that. Yeah. So, anyways, yeah, that's the point. So what what Zendo stereos do you have scheduled and coming up? Tell me I have tell me what's happening business-wise. On, 
June, actually, I'm going to Colorado, which I've been going to this place called Camp V, which is uh, near Telluride. I've gone five times in the past year. This is 100 acre property, much like you, with glamping tents and a river and a lake in like rural Colorado. It's funny, I live in a city of 40 million people and I fly into a town with a thousand people, <laughs> but the people there are super activated. Telluride having like, you know, a little bit of like a, a renaissance of, you know, both the tech money and all these different various people. So there's a cultural renaissance that this, you know, artist uh, spaces that uh, Planet V actually can be just got a grant from Colorado to build like an artist uh, residency. So they build in five units with a living space and a working space. So artists can, you can, you know, fill up an application and you can go and write your book there for two months, or you can work on your photography or your music or your Zender stereo. Uh, they have like water tanks that are empty that have set the Zendo stereo inside of it and look at the stars. It's in a uh, dark uh, sky part of America. So you can see the Milky Way with your naked eye. Wow. It's beautiful. So I'm going next weekend for uh, uh, Memorial Day weekend and it's called Planet V and I'm going to do Zendo stereos each night. Then I have uh, a calendar that I put at ZendoStereo.com and on my uh, my Instagram, Zendo Stereo. I will announce things. So I have a couple of... Uh, but both like uh, public and semi-private events that you can always DM me and I can send you more information. And uh, yeah, I'm doing uh, kind of our first soft launch of the Ember on June 11th on a Saturday in Santa Monica. And then uh, beyond that, it's like, yeah, just kind of, I have stuff coming up in New York. I want to go to Miami to do stuff with you. I'm probably going to go to Puerto Rico at the end of the, the summer. I just got back from Puerto Rico yesterday. It's beautiful over there. Yeah. I have a friend that moved from Boston over there and she's very active and she ex- experienced Zendo before pandemic. And, you know, so we're trying to, you know, get you know, the financial structure to be able to bring the gear and create the experience. Uh, yeah, I'm working with uh, a group from Vancouver, actually, that they have this whole therapeutic modality. We're looking to doing something in LA sometime in July. Uh, which I'm super excited for, or maybe late June. Um, so all these things are happening, which is very exciting. My dream is to continue to do events with, you know, stuff like with Deep In or with the various collaborators, i.e. the Sound Healer or the Movement. And then also to maybe consult for like a lot of these psychedelic, you know, new companies that, you know, they're like, I love Field Trip. I think they're great at what they do. Uh, just the idea, I think some of those people need like a musical director, right? It's like a lot of times the music is an afterthought. It's like, oh, here's the playlist we found with an hour worth of music, which works. But I'm saying put a little more thought and trust somebody who's, you know, passion or, I don't know, what do you call it? The the Ignite fuel is, I've really gone deep into that. And I think, uh, you know, what I'm doing and I'm proud of it, I've, you know, put 10,000 hours in, you know, in, in, in the long run that I'm delivering something that I feel is very helpful. And it's very unique, you know, this idea of the seamless, uninterrupted one hour experience of, you know, not knowing where songs begin and end, you know, it's like the curation and the, the sort of choice and the, and the spirit behind it. I really mm. stand by it, you know, and it's not even me. I'm just an antenna, which is, <laughs> mm. you know, I'm kind of like just channeling what comes through and then people respond. Amazing. I, I love this. Uh, and Puerto Rico, you know, I've just, I just spent two weeks there. I got back yesterday and there is so much opportunity inside of that, uh, territory. Uh, we, we spent time in Ricon, went over to Palmas del Mar and then San Juan and all throughout the islands. There are many of our friends and circles moving there and developing the island and um and i'm i'm curious to see as as community expands there i you know there there is some resistance from mm-hmm. the locals cuz change who love yep. you know, people resist change often uh but you know there is a, a lot of excitement there as well and i can definitely see zendo there so what i'd love to do is um get you set up we deep and we have a we have a new portal system so mm-hmm. I can send you a link. There is an application that you'll complete. And then once you um, that application is approved, then you'll get a link to the portal and you just begin submitting your event dates. And then we'll get those event dates up on the calendar. And we're going to be um, uh, further activating our marketing um, channels mm-hmm. to support 
the um, to support the promotion. And I'll say to personally, you know, as I go through all of these transitions from new relationship to moving to graduating from IPAC to realizing, hey, I don't want to be a stressed up startup founder. Uh, and I continue to refine things. I, uh, where was I going with this? <laughs> so much. I, yeah, there's, there's just so much, but I, I, I see of, um, yeah. The, oh, oh, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Um, so just, just yesterday, um, um, because I, I love to just be so transparent about my entrepreneur journey. Um, we have this SMS text messaging system. And if you're not on our SMS list, definitely go to wedeepen.com. There is a phone number at the top text. Count me into that phone number. And I just got, you know, billed a $2,100 um, fee to keep that going for the next year. And I was like, ah, oh my God, I wasn't expecting $2,100 to get charged in my account. Um, but mm. that just, I had to make that decision almost in the moment. Do I keep going or do I fold? And I chose to react or, or to keep the the channels activated. So I am looking forward to um, injecting more energy into the promotion of these experiences. So more people get access to this type mm-hmm. of work and know that it exists. When I mentioned the application process, um, it's it's a it's a it's just a few questions and it's a new process. You'll be approved very easily. It's essentially just for 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 Zendo and for. I wasn't Zendo. sweating. <laughs> yes, yeah, you you got it. You're in. I think I know somebody there. Yeah. You know somebody there. Yes, yeah. for sure. Um, so thank you so much for having this conversation with me. I know it was so spontaneous and to wake up and and and, and say yes, I'm in. And I love sharing your work. I yeah. do. I'm fascinated by your zone of genius. Mm. I think it's I appreciate important. your support and I appreciate your mission. And I think that the alignment of both each other and the time that we live in is great because what you're doing is very timely. It's literally like, you know, there's you no, know, some plants need to be water and you have a watering can right now. And this is the time to water those plants, right? Mm-hmm. Like the metaphor is very apt. It's like, I don't, I have nothing else to do with this watering can other than to pour it, you know, on on seeds and the seeds are the people who are like, Hey, I'm ready for some water. And once they show up, we're like, here, I have a can full of water that I can put on yours so you can then grow yourself. And ultimately, and I like that because of the last two years and all these different things, we do need to reset and come back to center. And I think we, we deepen literally with, I love your mission as a person who's partner or as a person who is not partner. And how I know you have relationships is some of those, it's like that, that, yummy stuff that you like to talk about which i love to talk about too because the whole point of all these emotions is to be more present with your you know love relationships or your friendships or your community whatever it is it's all love anyways right Mm -hmm. i mean you know the poly thing has that that tinge it's like people think oh it's about sex yeah sex can happen but you still need to get along with those people and relate and build trust and you know uh security to have those adventures right so the skill set is not lost with what we, we deepen those and what with, with Zander Stereo that we're trying to create that like, you know, building community through shared experiences. And then there's, there's mirror neurons that enhance, enhance group consciousness, right? So create brain states to facilitate emotional function between each other, which I think both we deepen and Zander does very well. Mm. Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm so excited as you, as you had mentioned that energy that, that keeps, that gets to now blossom even further as we move through into the deeper healing of COVID and of the world at large. Thank you so much for um, recording this show with me. I'll sh- definitely share all of your links in the podcast description and everybody listening. Thank you for tuning into another episode of Deepen with Christina. If you enjoyed this podcast, please Rate it, like it, follow it, share it with friends. Go to wedeepen.com, check out the calendar, check out the other podcasts on this network. And until next time, I love you all. Bye.